Okay, I think we are live. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'm very happy to see you all here and welcome to the last talk of the day. I am very excited to introduce to you Armando Bernal, who I actually just found out was a fellow Texan. So <laughs> that's exciting. Um, Armando is a neurodivergent board certified behavior analyst who supports kids between the ages of two and 12 years old. In addition, Armando provides autistic consultation, parent and therapist consultation, speaking, speaking engagements across the world, and supervision and mentorship to other BCBAs and therapists. Armando has completed the OBM certification process to further support and promote profit in several companies across the United States. Armando is also the founder of Autism International, an in-home ABA provider and the dis distributor of the podcast, A Different Path. He hopes to spread awareness and acceptance of autism by interviewing and sharing the stories of other individuals with autism. So if you were in our talks previously, you know how the CEUs work, but if you are, if this is your first time in the talk, there will be four CEU checks, and so there will be four attendance checks throughout the talk. You need to click that you are here for at least three of those, and they will be quite obvious. They will be there will be a big banner at the top, and you just need to click "I'm here." Um, if you do have any questions for Armando, we will have time at the end of the talk. Um, you can type them in the questions box at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you can add a question there. I will also try to keep an eye on the chat. And if there are any technical issues, usually you can solve them just by clicking refresh on your browser window. So I think that is it. And I will pass it over to you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for having me and you know sticking with me and being uh, with me for the last talk of the day. So like she said, uh, my name is Armando and um, I've been a board certified behavior analyst, a special education teacher. And I wanted to really hit home a couple of points through my presentation today where I talk about both my own journey of being diagnosed with autism and how it was growing up, but also um, what it meant uh, for the term masking and how that can represent two different faces of autism, both the one that I personally and others as well have had to uh, present in order to become more socially acceptable, but also those adverse effects of what that could potentially cause through various different ideologies, such as anxiety or depression. Um, so I'd like to start off with uh, this quote during a presentation such as this, and it just hopefully resonates with you uh, to better understand uh, autism as a whole. And so it says the biggest misconception about autism is that it really looks a certain way. It, in reality, autism is a spectrum of hopes, dreams, and a desire to be ourselves. And for me, at least, that really represents what I'm hoping to do and everything that I've been a part of in my career, as well as on my own personal life, to have people understand that autism isn't just you know, uh, Rain Man from the uh, early 90s, or it isn't uh, atypical or love on the spectrum. It, it's so many different kinds of individuals and so many different kinds of personalities that really can uh, become just a lot of great things if you just give people the understanding. I mean, for me personally, one of my go-to phrases I've heard my entire life is, but you don't look autistic. And it's really that kind of conception of, well, it doesn't need to look a certain way. It's, it's really about how a person is able to accomplish the different goals and individual ideas that they want in their lives that really make them who they are. Uh, and so before I begin anything, I wanted to start off and just say that this presentation, as well as the discussion we'll have in a question and answer, is never going to be about guilt or shame or humiliation. It's truly about allowing individuals to just learn more about what autism is, as well as just gaining more information from behavioral science as a whole and how we continue to grow. One thing that I try to discuss with either the parents that I'm serving or even the professionals that I'm speaking to is that it's a good thing when a science begins to grow and change 
and it allows it to become more adaptable because if a science starts to just say to itself as some professionals may say well this is as good as it gets or this is as um pertinent or what matters the most begins to plateau then it's no longer a science and it's certainly not a science that i would like to be a part of and so with that i'm not trying to critique anyone or or anything right it's it's in all the hopes of moving the behavioral science field forward in a way that maybe wasn't seen uh, even a couple of years ago, right? And there's a couple of things that we'll discuss that used to be such a high level of concern for the professionals in our field that is no longer the case. So I am going to speak about some research and I may discuss their findings in here, right? But it's not to target one person or a group of people. It's to discuss the differences or the findings that people have found through actual surveys and conversations with individuals with autism. Um, so I like to start off, as some of you will wonder, well, like, what makes him an authority for doing something like this? And for me, it's because I've personally had to live with autism in a time that wasn't necessarily accepting of others with differences. Uh, and so for me, I, I've lived in Texas, as, as they said, my whole life. And in the United States, in the early 90s and 2000s, in which I grew up in, diversity wasn't as accepted, nor was autism something that people really knew a whole lot about. I remember hearing a speaker at one time say, in the 90s, when he would give a speech, he would say, raise your hand if you know someone with autism. And only a couple of people would raise their hands in the crowd, and it would be likely professionals. And if you go to the same kind of presentation in 2022, you say the same question. Now it turns into, oh, I have, a, I have a friend with autism. I have a cousin with autism. I have a sister with autism. And everyone is becoming more and more aware of what that is. But for me, I was diagnosed at three. And doctors told my mother that I might as well learn sign language because I'm never going to be able to speak. And that was just the way of the world. That was the way it was for, for them. Um, and if that was the case, I wouldn't be speaking to you today if my mother just packed up her things and said, yep, sounds good. Thanks, doc, for the, for the diagnosis. I guess we'll just take care of him for the rest of our lives. But no, that wasn't the case. Um, my mother decided that although we didn't have a lot of money and we couldn't afford things like applied behavior analysis um, or naturalistic training or anything from an actual uh, professional at the time, she did have access to a free public library in her city. And so she decided to um, take as many books as she could about um, autism and learn more about it and, and read about it and try to use those same techniques that she would hear from these books or read from these books and use them on me. And with her, as well as a sister that is now 11 years older than me, and I try to stress that every time I see her, um, as well as a father who was uh, initially very deny in a denial of my diagnosis and eventually came around when my mother said, no, we're going to help him. This is not something he's going to grow out of. We need to support him as much as possible. And with their support as a family, I was able to become who I am today. Now, I like to say that I was the perfect child, right? I'm sure my mother and my family would disagree. And through their own support, I was able to overcome difficulties and misunderstandings and miscommunications that really took hold of me because the person you're seeing talking before you right as as much as i would like to say that oh everything is great i have no behaviors i have no concerns i'm super social that is far from it growing up i would bite the inside of my hand between my finger and my thumb because i was so frustrated that i couldn't speak my own language was saying uh sounds instead of words so choo choo for train this is for bug uh, pushing and pulling my family where they want, where I wanted them to go, um, hitting my head with different books because I was so frustrated that I couldn't speak or be able to do things right. And through their own support and allowing me to understand the need to be accepted with the world around me and understanding those consequences if I didn't, um, allowed me to uh, become better supportive of myself and through their own support give me a life that I am, I'm really proud of, you know, um, being, I mentioned becoming a special education teacher uh, and then a BCBA. But in this time period, I would hear from parents that said, my child's life is over. The uh, autism diagnosis is a cancer. It's his life is going to end before it even begins. And all of these things allowed me to motivate myself to say, that's, that's not going to be the case that I can, I can help you guys as much as I possibly can 
to better support your children as well as better support your own growth. And as I became a BCBA, I, I started realizing the same interventions that I was learning about in school were the same interventions that my mother uh, used on me. And I was like, wow, this could be very, very helpful. And I just kept thinking to myself, though, I have to do more. I want to do more. And eventually became a, a, a site manager for a whole clinic of making sure that the BCBAs under me were following through with uh, positive support for these kids, rather than focusing on things like eye contact or stereotypy that are at this point really unnecessary to really focus on if you're just looking for a child to learn new things, right? And giving more positive practice of what we're looking to achieve as well as self-advocacy and the promotion of independence. But even still, I'm always saying to myself, it has to be more. And so I created a podcast and I wanted to try and tell the individuals that I'm working with that, hey, there are other people, not only in the nation, but also throughout the world that are going through a diagnosis with autism. But there are so many great things that you can do, even with this own kind of diagnosis. And with that, I've interviewed uh, Elvis impersonator. I've interviewed best-selling authors, other behavior analysts, uh, writers, comedians, all of these different people that have a diagnosis but said, hey, I'm not my diagnosis. That's a part of me, but it isn't me. And having that understanding allowed, hopefully, to have a lot of people know that this diagnosis, where it wasn't really the case previously. Uh, and even still, I wanted to do more. And eventually, with my sister's support, who's a special education teacher as well, we decided to start a business because um, I wasn't busy enough, right? But with that, we started Autism International Consulting, as, as they mentioned, where I'm providing in-home ABA therapy. And I'm promoting what we have in the States, what, um, an individual education plan, which is uh, a whole profile for uh, special education um, students or children that need more restrictive approaches in order to be uh, better supported in their school system. And, and with that, I, I feel like now my only obstacle with supporting the kids is my own self rather than having to focus on how do I have other businesses or have other organizations do as much as possible, right? I now can be able to work with um, I, uh, children in Ireland or children in Kenya or children in all over the United States that I currently do. And, and being able to support those that truly are in need of, of care and services. But with all of this, right, I don't want to say that it just was a flip of a switch. My parents were able to help me and that was able to give me exactly what I needed. Truthfully, what really occurred in this situation as well is that I, for the most part, throughout a the time in my career or in a social setting, I'm masking. And the reason why I put in this slide is a lot of people aren't sure what that is. And that's okay, because it is a newer kind of terminology that people are getting more accustomed to that are pre that is uh, presenting more opportunities to learn. And I think, again, that's very important. So you may have heard of masking, but it may have also been called camouflaging or uh, compensating. And what all of this is, is just this suppression of naturalistic autistic responses. So there are some times where I am, for example, very almost overstimulated. And there were so many different exciting things around me that I just like, oh, oh, like that. And I want to hand flap in these situations, right? But what I do in this situation is either I, A, do it in private. And I, the only people that would know about it are my dogs because I do it in front of them because they don't judge. Uh, but also having this level of excitement, maybe in a different social situation, I've learned through my own experiences may not be as accepting in, in, a, in a typical setting, right? And what happens in these settings is, as I've grown up in my own experiences from, the, again, the early 2000s, keep in mind, everybody just wanted to be the same, is that you'll get made fun of or you'll get bullied or you'll get weird looks if you do these certain situations, right? And for me personally, I have decided that these kind of feelings are not something I would want to be a part of. And so I have learned to suppress these feelings. Is that a very good thing for me to do? Absolutely not, right? But is it what is allowing me to be in a bit more of a successful route in society? Yes, unfortunately that is so. And I've talked with parents about that. And I've said, you know, as much as we want the world to be accepting 
of the kids that we are serving or the kids that um, are, are doing certain aspects, right? I want them to be themselves, but I also need them to be um, accepted in this world and they need to become more accustomed to the world around them. And it's, it's a give and take. I will be honest with that. And I mind you that, right? But my whole mission is as long as these children are happy, that's what matters the most to me. And they're, and they're doing well, right? But it's this hiding and controlling behaviors. It's rather than hiding it completely and teaching the kids that I'm serving that there are certain times and places that it's allowable, right? That are, um, that is acceptable. And I'll give you another example because I like, I'm a very open book and transparent in my life. I get very excited about Christmas presents, right? Who doesn't? But for me, when I get really excited, I do hand flap. And my wife now, who has said, I actually love when you hand flap, when I give you something or I take you somewhere, because I know you that I got you a good Christmas present. I, got, I, I took you to a great place, and I'm so happy that I did that. And now it becomes socially acceptable, right? Or if I'm working with children, because I do a lot of early intervention, and these kids are on a swing and they start hand flapping or they start doing uh, um, what's called vocal stereotypy, these repetitive sounds or excitements, right? And I tell my therapist, why would we stop this? Because they're having a good time and it's their time, right? There's a difference between working with an individual and hoping that they are going to uh, an aspect of what you're trying to teach them a skill and then allowing them to promote their own kind of enjoyment because it is their time. And who are we to really judge that, right? But because of masking and this, and this unfortunate need to do so that I wish that we didn't have to, it's caused a lot of problems. And if you see on with Hall at all, um, one of the, one of the, and I put all of these articles at the end. So feel free to, you know, see that later as well. Um, there was potential and late or misdiagnosis in the females with ASC as they found is that unfortunately with, uh, females or in women with autism, right? There was less of a diagnosis uh, because of the fact that a lot of times the feelings that occur with autism as well are done internally rather than externally. So it's a lot harder to um, diagnose in those instances because it's not observable. It's something that's uh, within. And so that's been a bit of a problem as well. Uh, there's been extensive heightenings of anxiety and depression, as well as high stress and low mood and low self-esteem. And from my own personal experience, I have anxiety. I had to go on some pills recently um, to better support my, uh, my anxious feelings and understanding how to appropriately cope with these things, right? And understanding that that is just going to be a part of me, but it isn't me. That's not who I am. It's just, it's something that I have to deal with. And it's from, honestly, and I spoke to my wife about this, funny enough, yesterday, is that I feel like that's probably from this kind of exhaustion of having to do this throughout the day. But I know that if I did certain things that may be a part of these kind of autistic traits, I may not have the job that I do. I may not have a company that is flourishing as I do, right? And it's it's such a difficult realm that we're in. I mean, you talk, it, um, the amazing Dr. I mean, to give him a shout out, he talked about being inside the box and outside of the box is that we're slowly as a science beginning to move away from the old ways of thinking, uh, but it isn't fast enough. And so as we begin to accept more neurodiversity or more acceptance of the autistic traits, it is also significant to have the people that we're serving understand that they need to learn when it can be, you know, quote unquote, socially acceptable to do certain things. And it's because unfortunately through dehumanizing attitudes for autistic individuals that are still highly prevalent that this occurs. And it's those societal expectations that really play a role in a say self identity. So another example here is that when I was growing up in middle school and high school, all I wanted to do was fit in. I'm sure a lot of kids feel that way. And in the early nineties and two thousands, it was again, how are you different? Let me find a way that you're different and let me make fun of that in order to, to really be one of those quote unquote cool kids, right? At least that was my experience. And I wanted to just hide my autism as best as possible. And I didn't, and truth be told, I was just ashamed of it at that time because I, I, I didn't really accept who I really was. And it wasn't until college that I started saying, no, I am autistic, that I really started to be a lot happier than what I realized I wasn't in the middle school and high school time. 
And it wasn't until I was able to really accept who I was that these feelings of, you know, stress of having to keep up who I am all day, every day at home, not at home, that really began to subside once I began to understand my own self identity. But when you see that there is still, unfortunately, some dehumanizing traits that are recurring with the individuals that we're, we're speaking on, right? I mean, you see this sometimes in the news, and unfortunately, in some aspects of politics, we still see people making fun of individuals with disabilities or special needs. And it's it's disgusting, and it's it's terrible. But that just represents exactly what needs to be done in order to change the mindset. There are still people out there that are promoting this difficult mindset that still causes a lot of individuals to want to mask. And it's not until everyone can get together and say and accept people for who they really are that we can do that while also promoting that social acceptance that we're trying to reach out to, right? So through that study uh, from Hall, again, there was a big survey that was given out. And they were asking people, why is it that you camouflage? What are the motivations? What are your consequences? And I'll give some time to read this, but I would like to point out some things that were said, right? And with the motivations, one thing that really stuck to me was to they wanted to either know or be known. That's really where all of this comes together. It comes together with people just wanting to be seen or to be heard or to make friends that we're serving, despite any kind of hand flapping or repetitive speech or different kinds of behaviors, really what they're wanting to see is, can I make a friend? Can I have somebody that also understands me? And when we look at this and we see the different kinds of social aspects that we can put children in to hopefully make friends, the need to camouflage or the need to mask can slowly be slipped away and a real face can be seen. I did not know another individual with autism until college. And the only reason why I knew that was because I um, got the social media, Facebook, and found a group online that said that they also had autism. And it was a group of like 20 people. And again, when you think about how many people on Facebook, there's only 20 people in this group. It's so minimal, right? And that was just all over the nation for the United States. And I remember seeing that and I just, I cried because it was the first time that I felt like somebody really understood me. And from that point on, I was able to be who I really was. I could be as direct as I wanted. I could be as, you know, black and white or communicative as I wanted. I could not say anything. And people would be like, hey, you know, he's cool. He's there. He just doesn't want to talk right now. Solid. That's totally fine. And from that point forward, you start seeing this growth in social media, or you start seeing this growth in um, different ways of communicating with each other. And then we start seeing more acceptance and more understanding because there is this support group now that's being established for individuals with autism. And it's the friendships that are being made that allow people to have to no longer feel like they need to mask. This, this decrease in stressful situations or frustrations, right? Some other areas that um, in this graph that just seems so important to, to take into consideration also was this idea that we're betraying ourselves. If, if we can't even accept who we are, right? It turns into a big concern of, well, what are we doing here? What are we, what are we able to accomplish to, to better promote our own kind of self identity? And the best way to do that is be ourselves. And it's, it's sad when you look at some of these and you start seeing the different feelings and emotions. And I don't try and say all of this to try and, you know, bring anyone down. I say this more to bring a sense of awareness of what is currently occurring in individuals with autism that are masking and promoting a conversation of, well, what's the next steps here? What can be done in order to to better promote this kind of positive feeling rather than these negative feelings, right? And we have this conversation now where there's success and failure, where it's what happens when we are successful with masking and what happens when we do fail with masking. And there's this difference actually that was found between uh, males with autism and females with autism and why it's easier than also to recognize between the two sexes. And 
with with males in that sense there's a bit more overt aggression that was being seen that recognize that doctors were able to recognize why because it's very external and it allows people to understand these um expectations that are being presented oh he has aggression because he's not able to communicate his wants and needs he has these aggression uh, instances because he isn't getting what he wants things that are very typical that you would see in an aba type field right whereas on the female side of things there was more social isolation things that are internal and it was a bit more difficult so the the study was really interesting where it was also saying that with um other women with women in a, in a newer typical setting right there was less aggression if there was frustration or upset but instead what occurred was gossip or social isolation as i said or leaving people out of certain fun activities right which individuals with autism may not necessarily are bad things or things that could be occurring that cause them really to just be left out in the cold and not really understand what are the next steps here right so when we talk about, I like to start with failure, so I'm not, you know, anyone at that point as well, but this talk of failure is then becoming, okay, if they're not able to speak accordingly or be able to promote themselves in these kind of social situations that we're hoping for them to be accepted in, then we get more of these concerns of anxiety and depression and, right? But if they're able to promote some kind of successful social situation, now we begin to see friendships being made or being able to be willing to take part in different kinds of presentations or group activities or things like that. So as much as the masking is still maintaining a very difficult time to fit in, it also allows opportunities to arise. So now there's this idea of, okay, well, do I mask and get opportunities or do I take off this mask and potentially get stuck in a sense of social isolation that I don't want to be a part of? And you see this dichotomy of ideas that are being talked about in order to better promote this division that we're trying to uh, restrain ourselves from. So these results on masking, as I talked about, was this lower, they occur typically because there's a lower social and adaptive functioning skill. They're not able to adapt as well. Um, and with my own masking as well, when we see the different things that me personally, I feel like I've been able to do, it starts becoming a concern of, okay, where is, where is this going for me? Why am I even having this feeling of doing this? And there's a prevalence of anxiety and depression that do remain high throughout the transitioning to adulthood. And when we think about why that is, we have the transition occur where it's, you're already trying to figure out who you are as a neurotypical individual. And when you add in the diagnosis of autism and you're, you've been trying to struggle with social cues or social um, expectations, then we become a bit more on the difficult side of understanding where we stand with things. And this idea of having to pretend to not be autistic can erode that self-identity, as we have mentioned. And it's pretending in such a way that we forget who we are. And my role in my own company, as well as my role in trying to promote self-identity and self-advocacy in the kids that I'm serving, allows them to remember that, yes, I have this diagnosis, but it's not everything I am. And I, am, I can accomplish so much more despite having a diagnosis. And I'm really good at it. Right. And understanding that this thinking of your strengths, thinking of the things that you can accomplish will hopefully promote a sense of positivity that will remind you of who you really are. Right. It's when it was the study was completed, it was determined that camouflaging can be a predictor of psychological distress. And through the psychological distress comes this exhaustion. Some of you may have heard of autistic burnout. And what that really is. So autistic burnout, again, is for those that don't, is just this sense of overall exhaustion at the end of the day of, man, I had to laugh at XYZ joke because um, so-and-so said it. And I didn't think it was very funny, but other people did. So I have to do that, right? It's fitting into certain kinds of situations or actions that allow us to do well in the moment, but don't realize the negative impact that it's having on us. And but it's something that needs to be done uh, for us individuals with autism, because otherwise, what's the alternative here is that, again, we're left with the social isolation that 
none of us want to be a part of. We all want friends. We all want people to talk to. And it, it helps in that situation. So this capacity of reduction dealing with the negative emotions, we start having this, this lack of emotions that will uh, be a little bit more difficult to understand, where we, we don't know how to manage the anger or the sadness of things, right? Or this redu reduction of authenticity and acceptance of not really figuring out what it means to be authentic, where we're saying, oh, in this situation, I have to say this, this is the way it goes. I think one good example of this that a lot of people do is, you know, unfortunately, if there's a death of the family or uh, a death that somebody has, the thing that we say is, I'm sorry, right? And when you really break that kind of idea down is, well, what is it that you're sorry for? You didn't cause the, you know, the death, unfortunately, right? Or you didn't, you didn't do that. Or the one thing that we do in uh, a situation when you first start, start talking to somebody is, hey, how are you doing? And your response is usually, I'm okay, or I'm good. Thanks for asking. How are you? And is it really a conversation of, oh, do you want to know about it? Or is it more of something that is just an expectation? Another is please and thank you. All of these things that are something that is an expectation is not very well understood by other individuals with autism. Um, but we know that we have to do these things or say these things in order to be a little bit more accepted, right? And one of the hardest things, and I promise this will be the last thing that is is difficult to speak, but the idea, and this is just a trigger of it, of, of unaliving, is uh, the, the idea of suicidality, that it can lead to that. And it's it's very difficult to accept, uh, but it's, it's the way that we're currently headed with some of these masking alternatives. If someone isn't being appropriately checked on or appropriately spoken to, or has somebody that they can turn to, it can be very difficult. And so again, it was spoken of earlier is if you see somebody that you don't know their story or you don't know what's going on with them truly, then the next step for you is going to say, you know, how, how can I help you? Are you okay? What is it that you need in this moment? How can I help you grow? How can I support you? All of these feelings are these basic conversations of, okay, what are the next steps in understanding like, where can you go from here? And this can help support a person understand like, hey, it's not all bad because I have somebody that I can truly be myself around with no judgment. And even the smallest aspect of that, even the the tiniest different kind of action that you say, hey, there's no judgment here. You can talk to me however you want and understand that there is no ill will toward it or no ill intention toward it can really mean the world to a lot of people. and. So on a, on a more positive note, what can be done? What can be done in both the fields of ABA and now acceptance and commitment therapy is a very increasing area of study and growth that allow us to better understand how we can promote success. And for those that don't know the differences, I just did a very quick chart between the two where ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, is that, just that focus of providing patients with <coughs> behavioral skills and prerequisite skills. There's a BCBA like myself or RBTs, and there's an overall plan to better support the kids that we are serving, right? It focuses on social and daily living skills. And while in the acceptance commitment therapy section, we have that is very more focused on mindfulness or this idea that the internal feelings that we're having, now keep in mind, we said earlier that it was very difficult to truly understand that aspect, but we're starting to grow again in this field to learn more about it that promotes that. So understanding how our person is feeling and then understanding the actions that we can, that can externally be taken after the fact is very significant. So the idea behind it is imagine being lost in the middle of nowhere. What are your steps here? You begin to say, okay, well, I can call for help or I can walk to a mile to the gas station or I can do X, Y, Z to get some assistance, right? So that's the physical or the external portion. Now the internal portion is, imagine being in an anxiety episode or a depression episode. The steps taken there is to figure out solutions that can better promote what you're talking about and better promote the idea that there can be this success as, as we continue forward, right? So we use our minds to help us 
And then we prevent our mind, we stop our minds from preventing us from making such positive choices where we have this anxiety and these depressions. And it's, and it's truly helped me through my own anxiety episodes where I, I'm just, I'm so exhausted from, from masking or I'm so exhausted from better understanding my own self and saying, how can I promote positive practice and allow myself to be more of who I am? And for instance, for me, it was more about being open and honest about saying that I value transparency and communication. And because I was able to replace these feelings of I need to hide who I am, or I need to hide my own feelings and replace it with, I can communicate, I can be transparent with how I'm feeling or say, hey, actually, I need to take a minute. This is a lot for me. Um, and know that people this day and age are going to be very accepting of that is, is very imperative. On the ABA side things though, right? That true for me is always about promoting these baseline skills, these prerequisite skills that allow an individual to understand how to appropriately promote a feeling of self-identity and acceptance. Because where does some of this come from? This idea of masking comes from not truly knowing what to do in certain situations. I don't know how to respond in XYZ social situation. I don't know how to make a conversation. I don't know how to uh, promote certain skills, or I don't know how to understand my strengths and weaknesses and how do, I, how do I get better from that? But through ABA, through this behavioral science terminology and this practice, we begin to see positive change in the people that we're serving because it, it promotes the self-advocacy that we're looking for, but it also promotes the skills that are needed in order to be successful in a day-to-day -day lifestyle, right? If we can look at a child at two and think about, yes, you're two, but what about 12? What about 22? And know that they've accomplished any skill that we think that they would need at that certain age, then I'd say it's been a pretty good job. And I'd say that it's the same for that individual, the individual taking on this kind of science and can say to themselves, okay, I, you know, I really want to learn how to talk with people and it's so hard for me, but having that support group, like I had my family or another person may have their own guardian or their own parent, then it turns into, okay, I have somebody I can turn to. So when things are, are dumb or stupid, or I don't get it, I can tell them that and they can understand, Hey, that's okay. This is what it really means. And for me personally, that's usually my sister. I love my mother, but um it's it's always just been my sister in that sense it's probably why i started a company with her but with my sister it was always like i don't understand why i need to do xyz this is so ridiculous and she would calm me down in these situations and say hey that's okay this is why we're doing these things and making it a bit more black and white for me allowed me to better understand why these expectations are happening and again that let me lower my anxiety or let me lower this feeling of needing a mask all the time because i knew that i could trust her with how i really felt I knew that I could trust my wife with how I really felt in certain situations say, look, I really don't want to do this because this is so ridiculous or this is so silly. And being that transparent person um, allowed me to do such a thing. And when we think about, let's start initially with the ABA aspect and we think about what can be done to um, better promote the field. It's exactly what we're doing now. It's moving away from eye contact being significant. It's moving away from stereotypy being uh, significant and moving toward a more naturalistic play approach or a more naturalistic setting where the kids are able to play with each other and give time to both learn from their peers as well as possibly fail and know that they have that therapist or that BCBA to turn to and say like, hey, it's okay. This is how we can promote this, right? And, and continue forward with that. So when we talk about the ABA too, it, it's important because I think we have some parents on here as well, it's very important to just find somebody in the field that is willing to listen to you and understand that your child is an individual, that they may not like everything that is going on, or they may not like the different kinds of practices that are, you know, quote unquote, significant for them. But either A, showing them why it's important, or B, allowing them to participate in a more naturalistic way can better promote this and lower that feeling of needing to mask, right? Whereas in the acceptance commitment therapy, this is a bit more of those um, higher independent individuals that can understand and accept, hey, this is actually an anxiety episode for me. This is how I can resolve this episode. And 
as the role for those that are looking to support this and looking to support those that they are really trying to see become successful. The best thing that can possibly be done in a situation where masking is a struggle is to let them know that they can be their true selves around you, that they can be who they really need to be um, in order to just become more accepted, right? And there's this model that was presented uh, with the acceptance and commitment therapy, where it was called the Hexaflex model. And you see that there's different components of it that are significant for an individual's growth, as well as for a person to really become promoted in their own well-being, right? And through that, we have this acceptance as well as this willingness. So acceptance, yes, being accepting of who a person is and allowing them to understand their own self-identity. That's the initial step that we can do in order to lower these defenses that occur during masking and say, hey, I accept you for who you are. But then promoting that same kind of feeling for the, that person and say, now you need to accept who you are as well. So much like myself, when I was younger and I was you know, 10, 11, 12, and I was like, I, this isn't who I am. And this, I'm not autistic. I'm I'm not X, Y, Z, there's no way. And I, I just want to be friends with the people here and I don't want them to know any of my weaknesses, right? And helping a person understand that they don't need to be that way, that they can just be this person and say like, hey, this is me. And if you don't like it, deal with it. That is hopefully in a less direct way, in a more positive way, right? Um, but being able to accept that, I think is going to be an aspect for themselves this diffusion of creating distance away from one's own thoughts. I personally, for me, I am continually, or I was at least, thankfully until I received some medical support, I was in my own head for a lot of things. I was saying like, oh, no one is going to accept me, or I have to do this in these situations, or I have to do that. And when I started to think about it and realize like, hey, like, I don't need to do that. I can just be my own self, if I'm overthinking, or if I think that something is maybe going to be inappropriate, I can say this in private, or I can just think it to myself, I can make little notes to myself in order to better support it. I think the best thing that happened to me, funny enough, was that um, I was actually in a previous job, I was written up for being too direct, or too black and white. And they said that I would just, um, wasn't being as appropriate as I could be in these situations, that it was just very harsh, right? And at the initial time, I was very upset about it because I was like, I'm just being myself. But again, when I think about masking, where that could have been a significant issue, I turned it around and I tried to make it more of a positive and say, okay, this allowed me to take an introspective look and realize that people are not going to think the same way I do. And it allowed me to start realizing that this is the case for anyone that I may be very direct, but that may not be appropriate. And it's not being very empathetic and it's not having people understand those expectations from me and it allowed me to understand how to communicate in different ways to different people based on their own kind of personality, based on their own way of presenting themselves. And although this was difficult initially for my own psychological growth, it allowed me to then better promote my own self and better promote an idea of accepting the things I can't change and, and promoting a better way of doing things, right? Um, and then more importantly, focus on focusing on the happiness that is presented to you and focusing on the good things that are in front of you. And instead of say, saying that, okay, this is it, you know, there's nothing more and I'm not gonna be able to do more, being able to accept like, wow, so many great things have happened and understanding that these things that I was worried about with my own kind of masking are, are not as significant because of how much I've been able to find the support and the love and the care from the people that are surrounding me. And being able to just control this and have a flexible manner of thinking is just another way of better promoting this idea of like, hey, like, I don't need to stress out on things that don't necessarily matter a whole lot, right? And being able to then develop myself as an observer and looking at my own actions 
of masking and evaluating for my own self, hey, is this important or is this really going to make a difference in a social setting? And if I say, no, it's not going to make a difference in a social setting, then that means that I can be more of myself. It allows that mask, again, not just to come off when I said earlier with the people that love and care about me, but also with people that are not as familiar with me. Because I realized at that moment that, oh, if it doesn't matter in a social setting, then why am I doing it in the first place? And it's this evaluation and this development as an observer to better understand, excuse me, better understand these expectations of like, hey, like, I can be my own self in situations I didn't even think about before. And it, lo and it let me be a bit more calm or a bit more understanding of what is going on around me uh, to then just become an overall, hopefully, better person in that sense. Well, just keeping in mind of remaining close to our values and remaining close to what matters mostly to us and better understanding what that even looks like. So for me, yes, I do mask, but my values were how do I better support my family? Or how can I continue to grow in my field? And how do I allow others to grow in this field as well? And the best way that I could have possibly done that was by um, promoting myself in a way that accepted my own autism, accepted my own masking, and openly speak about these things, and openly want to take questions or be willing to understand other points of view that don't necessarily agree with me. Because it allowed me to say, hey, these are the things I stand by. These are the things I know and I want to be proud of. And making sure that I'm not straying away from those things through like behavioral drift and other aspects um, is so imperative. And if I'm able to remain close to my values and continue to grow myself both in this field as well as a person, then that allows me to eventually meet people like you guys and people that um, are willing to listen and willing to learn from other individuals with autism, whether it's me or other people, I think that's what really remains significant. And if you're able to do all of these things and you see how each of these things has been connected to one or the other, you can go from acceptance to contact, or you go to fusion to acceptance and so on and so on, you begin to see this overall commitment of developing ourselves into a larger and larger pattern of this behavioral change where we're able to say, hey, I want to move from X, Y, Z. How do I do this? How do I continue to become better. And the best way to do that through a masking lens or through ABA or through acceptance and commitment therapy is going to be looking inward and understanding what are the next steps and how do I resolve this? How do I usually respond in certain situations? Does that work? Yes, no. If it doesn't, how do I change from there? Again, you know, I, I, I've just, I was so excited about hearing Dr. Freiman earlier today talk about, you know, emotions. And that's something that was very difficult for me to accept initially in this field because it's it's not external. It's, you know, ABA is very much a, a black and white kind of thing where it's, oh, behaviors only happen for one of these four reasons. But this promotion of understanding the inward private events that a person has can allow you to better understand oneself as well as somebody else. And if we're able to commit ourselves to this larger and larger pattern of understanding like, hey, I don't need to be xyz i can go this route i think that develops behavioral change and as we continue on right i want to just leave you guys with a little bit more these are all the references for you guys again you don't need to write all this i think all of this is recorded um but with it it allows us to better understand and better promote ourselves as being who we really need to be and it was for so long that in the field of aba and the just the field of behavioral science as a whole that there was this desperate need to change the behaviors of those that did not fit the social norms to it slowly transitioning to, yes, we accept you and you're, you're able to do exactly what you want, but you still need to be able to complete actions at work, or you still need to be able to complete um, interactions with friends and families, but you can still do whatever it is you like, as long as that's still possible. And that's something that I try to promote in the kids and the and teenagers and so on that I serve is that as much as that we want this world, like I said earlier, to accept the children that we have and all of that. And it certainly will as every year as we get close, you know, more and more diverse, 
it's also important for the kids to understand that they need to accept the people around them as well, that they need to be able to uh, be able to have a conversation if they want to, or be able to accomplish X, Y, Z at a job if they want to. The key is here again, if they want to. It's through the support and and care that each and every one of you give your your patient, your client, your your child, whatever it is, that really sees the most success. Um, and and with that, I'll just I'll leave you guys with this that I always say this in my presentations that all of you are going above and beyond as it is to go to these kind of conferences or to go to these kind of presentations because it really shows how much you care about the success and the welfare of those that are neurodiverse. So it, it truly is an honor to to be with each of you today. Um, and it's it's something that I, I was very excited about. So I hope that this was very helpful. Um, and it, it's something that um, you all have enjoyed. Um, I have some contact information. I can put some of it also in the chat after I get out of this presentation. But this QR code here, that goes directly to um, my website. Um, so it's a lot easier. I know we like doing that now. So, but yeah, but you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, um, as well as I have my email. And uh, my email. again, I, I truly do thank all of you guys for, for being a part of this. So thank you. And I, I guess now it's questions and answers. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that and for sharing with us your lived experience with autism and masking and for being so open about it. and. Um, I definitely think you brought up some important points about masking that I think can sometimes be overlooked by neurotypicals, um, especially like those who are working with people on the spectrum. Um, but yeah, I found your talk very fascinating and I'm sure others did as well. Um, we did have one question um, from Kelly Ann. She wanted to know, how do you respond to people who have ASD who refute ABA and say that it is abusive? Yeah, no, I actually really, I'm, you know, it's funny, it, it does come up and I'm really glad. It's, I have two sides of it, where on one side, people are saying, you're such an inspiration, really great job for, you know, being where you are. And then on the other side, I have people that say, how could you ever be a part of this? This is terrible, right? And it's, to that I say that there are always going to be people that are not providing positive practice, whether that's an ABA or as a doctor or as a lawyer or whatever it is, right? But I think what's important when you look for the positives in ABA is you really need to look at that child. And is that child laughing, smiling? Are they seeing improvement? Are they happy, right? And mm -hmm. if you can see that, then I would say that that's something to promote as ABA. And it's something that is important. I always welcome the the feedback of like ABA is, you know, abuse or whatever it is, right? But to that question, I then say, what examples do you have to present that, right? What is, what is that? How are you comparing it to that? And if they have XYZ comparison, they're like, oh, well, this BCBA I knew back then, right? Although they should be honored and respected, these individuals with autism that are saying this, right? It's also important that this is very anecdotal, that this is a one- BCBA person. It's not every BCBA in the world that is presenting this way. We have some BCBAs that are unfortunately doing, you know, electroshock therapy or other terrible things, right? But we have other BCBAs that are promoting feeding in a child that only ate veggie chips for seven years of his life. We are having BCBAs that are promoting uh, communication because he want that child really wants to say I love you to his mom, but he's just not able to. And and if you bring about anecdotal stories like this obviously yes i totally understand them but i i hope that the people i'm talking to in those moments are keeping in mind that not everyone in the field is like that and it's because of you know universities like like you guys or or other areas of promotional growth that it's it's showing that aba is not what it was 20 30 years ago that there is a, a large crowd that is looking to become more accepting of those with neurodiversity and much more allowing them to speak of their own accord, uh, much like this, to, to better promote that. Yeah, and thank you so much. And we have one more question from Gabby in the chat. Um, she's asking if, which papers do you recommend to, oh, keeps moving as people are talking, uh, which papers do you recommend to check on for someone uh, 
wait, where did it go? Sorry, people are talking. Someone who is developing a peer support group and ACT-based group for parents of adults with ASD and ID. So papers related to developing a peer support group. Um, yeah. If you have any on the top of your head, or you can also maybe share with in the chat or share it with us later and we can add it. Let me go ahead and share that with you guys uh, later. But there was a couple of group, uh, books that I was recommended from other friends. Because again, I say that I have these neurodiverse um, groups that I'm a part of now. And so we all try and help mm -hmm. each other out. Is um, There was one that I was looking at for teenagers. It was Act for Adolescents, Treating Teens and Adolescents by Sherry Terrell. Um, mm -hmm. And Acceptance and Mindfulness Toolbox for Children by Timothy Gordon. I'll try and write those in the chat. Um, okay. And they're on Amazon, and I was I was going to um, I, I look at them pretty frequently just because one they were recommended to me by a by a good friend. Um, uh, his name is Brian Middleton, the bearded behaviorist. In case anybody knows him, yeah, I know, um, yeah. as well as um, a few others as well. And she also wanted to know what your perspective is on naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. Um, yeah, and do you use them yourself? I do. So a lot of what I do now is naturalistic, is that I try to stay away. I mean, there is this stereotype of, well, um, teacher time or working with the kids needs to be at the table. That's the only way they're going to learn. Why? These kids are five. These kids are three years old. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we're doing is play based. A lot of it is going to be naturalistic. And I even do that with my teenagers as well, where, yes, I'll give them models of um social situations but i'll i'll see if we can go into a community-based setting and see how they respond in contrived opportunities and contrived opportunities i mean like if then i'll take him or her to an art studio and see if there's a way for that kid to promote conversation with somebody because we practice it right or if it's not in um it's not you know going really well right then maybe i'll do something uh, a bit professional say hey you know can i talk to you for a minute just like something very natural and give some advice or some pep talk and try again right it's something that's very safe and protected and when you think about it from a younger kid perspective as well um you're working with kids on sharing or taking turns but then you let them all in a clinic setting you put them all in a gym together and you just see how they respond you don't interact you don't you just watch to make sure they're safe and seeing if they can learn and you know sure enough one of those kids you're working with starts playing tag with somebody because he likes to play with them and it's i think naturalistic as we continue on with aba is going to grow in that aspect where it's no longer gone are going to be the days of you're sitting at a table for an hour and you're you're going to have to do teacher time until you get everything right no there's there's a time to do that appropriately because when you think about social situations why is that significant to sit at a table because schools need you to sit at the yeah. table it's it's those situations are accepting right but to learn real skills and be able to generalize it out, you're going to need these naturalistic settings to better promote that. Um, and it's it's so important to me, both because I'm a BCBA and a special ed teacher, to understand where is all of this going? I don't want to see this kid at home all the time. I don't want to see this kid in a clinic all the time. How am I doing my job to get them back into a school setting or with their own neurotypical peers? How am I doing my job to get them back there? And how what is the process to do that right so as yeah. soon as i'm able to do that then i feel like i've done my job yeah okay well thank you so much i don't know if there is any more chat questions no i think that is everyone's questions but thank you so much again for coming we were i really enjoyed it so and i'm glad to meet you and have you with us um i'm going to invite carola and katarina on now so that we can say goodbye to everyone. There we, there we go. Hi. So um, I, I just thank you very much, Armando, for sharing your insight with us. It's been a lovely talk, a really informative one. And we will all use what we learned in our practice and in research, of course. So because this was our last talk for the conference, I just wanted to thank everyone. <coughs> Let me go through my long list here. So first of all, thank you, a big thank you to our invited speakers who devoted their time to make this conference happen. So Jane McCready, Professor Pat Fryman, Matt Broadhead, 
and Dr. Matt Broadhead and Armando Bernal. We are grateful for your contributions and we enjoyed very much listening to your presentations. And of course, a big thank you to our paper presenters. Um, earlier on this morning in Europe, you made our paper sessions rich and diverse, and it was great to listen to presentations spanning from interventions for infants to teaching verbal behavior, best practice around the world, including in Poland, the United Arab Emirates, and the use of behavior analysis for treating Alzheimer's, increasing energy efficiency, and teaching university students. So that, that was a really uh, rich paper session that I enjoyed very much. And um, Chris and Mallory from Behavior Life, as always, thank you for an exceptional technical support. And finally, I would like to thank my good colleagues, Professor Carola Greenberger, Dr. Devon Raymond, and Dr. Nicola Booth, um, for your work behind the scenes for the preparation of the conference. And so just a reminder that you can all watch the recorded event at a later time. You can visit our Center for Behavior Analysis website for information on our activities and for opportunities to collaborate with us. And I hope to see many of you again soon in, 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 in different contexts. And in the meantime, I just wanted to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. And over to you, Carola. Yes, thanks very much, Katarina, and, and thanks very much, Armando. I really enjoyed your talk. I enjoyed all the talks uh, the, today. I think we, uh, it was it was very very good to hear from the whole range of spectrums from from Jane this morning talking about very severe autism right through to to Armando presenting himself uh, as neurodivergent and and a behavior analyst at the same time. I thought that was a really good spread and the professionals in between. Uh, with Pat Prime and, and uh, Matt Broadhead and the, all the all the um, all the paper presenter, presenters and the chairs of the sessions as well to thank everybody um, from the Center for Behavior Analysis. As you said, Carolina, we have a web page. We have under resources on the web page. We have got many presentations, recordings that we've uh, we've been able to record over the years. Feel free to they're all free so feel free to listen to as many and we'll try and have this conference it'll probably take a week or two to get get all of that organized but you'll be able to to uh, revisit the talks and that's going to be uh, hopefully a really useful resource for everybody so uh devon do you want to contribute to thank everyone for coming i had a really good time i enjoyed all the speakers yeah so thanks very much uh, everybody and i think we'll just uh We'll close here at this point and thanks Katarina for doing a sterling job chairing the conference committee and keeping us all in line whenever everybody was spread all over the place but you got it done and it, it was a very enjoyable day. Thanks very much everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.